to the moon and beyond what space exploration will look like in the year 2069. This is on The Conversation. It's by Marion Frankel, Martin Anker, Axel Ellery, Anders Sandberg, Frederick Martin, Monica Grady, and it's uh, from the McQueen Mary University of London, UK. What space exploration, space travel look like in about 50 years. What will space exploration be like a century after the first moon landing? In the fifth and final episode of the podcast that series that they have here, To the Moon and Beyond, we speak, they say, to space scientists about the missions they are dreaming about and planning for the future. In episode four, we hear about plans to establish a moon, a base on the moon, potentially mining the lunar surface for minerals, and even water that could be turned into rocket fuel. Episode 5 finds out what happens when this is built. How could a base on the moon help us travel to other parts of the solar system? And where should we go? These are some of the questions we investigate. We start by finding out why the moon is seen as such a great place from which to launch missions further into space. Ultimately, it's down to the fact that the hardest part of any space journey is getting a rocket out of Earth's gravity. Alex Ellery, an associate professor of space robotics and space technology at Carleton University in Canada, explains the different ways it's possible to exploit the Moon's weak gravity. One way is to build a new space station that orbits the Moon, something NASA and other international space stations are already planning. Another way is to build a base on the Moon's surface using lunar resources This would be much more ambitious, but could ultimately be safer and more sustainable, according to Ellery. He says, in fact, there's a veritable host of useful stuff on the moon. Iron, aluminum, titanium, silicon, ceramics, regents, regolith gases of various kinds, and so on, from which it's possible to build an entire infrastructure and to do this robotically. This is how we get the true value of using the moon as a stepping stone towards Mars and elsewhere. While different people have different views about when we'll actually make it back to the moon and how, most academics we've spoken to are confident that it will happen. Monica Grady, professor of planetary and space sciences at the Open University in the UK, told us where she would go once a moon base is set up. For her, it's all about traveling to the places where life might begin. This could be Mars, Jupiter's moon Europa, or Saturn's moon Enceladus. Europa and Enceladus are usually in the sense that they have, uh, are unusual in the sense that they have huge internal liquid oceans buried under a thick sheet of ice, heated by the gravitational tug of the huge planets that they orbit. Grady says, If I had to really pick one place where I thought there was definitely going to be life, a living life, I would say Europa, because Europa has had all those building blocks, it's had all the ingredients, it's had plenty of time. I imagine that the ocean floor, Europa's ocean floor, must be a relatively stable environment for life to develop. Grady also explains how scientists would go about finding life on another planet when that life is probably not going to be visible aliens walking around above ground. In cold places like Mars, Europa, or in Geladus, it's more likely to be some sort of microorganism that's not visible to the naked eye and is deep below the surface. When it comes to finding life elsewhere in the solar system, a big concern is the extent that human, humans and robots built by humans may contaminate alien ecosystems in the process. At the same time, futurists warn that space exploration is a necessary part of human survival. Anders Sandberg from the Future of Humanities Institute at Oxford University says the financial cost of space exploration is a worthwhile worthwhile investment. In terms of cost effectiveness, space is maybe not the cheapest way of saving humanity. There are many other important things we can and should do down here but it's not a competition. It's not like the space budget is always eating into the budget of fixing the environment. In fact, 
they're quite complementary. One of the best ways of monitoring the environment is, after all, from space. Sandberg predicts that humans could be living on Mars in 30 to 100 years' time. Going beyond our solar system to exoplanets will be much thick, trickier, but this is uh, the next step. And there are scientists working on far-flung missions to explore them. Frederick Marin, an astrophysicist at the University of Strasbourg in France, is one of them. He tells us about ideas for a giant, multi-generational spaceship that could go the distance. He says, you have to find a way to keep your crew alive for centuries, long missions, and part of my work is to investigate if this is feasible in biological terms, in terms of physics, chemistry, food production, and energy production, artificial gravity, and so on. So I'm currently working on simulations for multi-generational space travels in which a population will live inside a vessel and procreate, die, and the new generation will continue this cycle until the population reaches an exoplanet. While this kind of mission may get off the ground in the next 50 years, current technology would not see it arrive at the nearest exoplanet until well beyond 2069 into future centuries. So watch this space, they say. That's a very nice plan, very nice dreams, but you know, we have problems. And unfortunately, these problems that we have on Earth are not held here on Earth. They also travel with the, the, astro the astronauts and the engineers into space. One of this is having to do with the recent um, findings of the hole in the Soyuz spacecraft that is attached to the International Space Station. As we know, the two biggest partners of the ISS is the United States, NASA and Russia, Roscosmos. They had found that this part of the ISS had a leak. It was uh, leaking its air, its atmosphere. It was losing pressure from the air. And um, they found a hole in it, that the hole was made from the inside towards the outside. Originally, before they examined the hole, they thought it was a micrometeorite that perhaps pounded and, and hit and made a hole, but no, the hole was from the inside out meaning that it was intentional, or whatever it was. In any case, the Russians did investigate it. NASA wanted to find out the reason, what would happen. Russia did promise that when it found out what caused that hole, it would make a statement, a worldwide statement, for everybody to know. Well, they do know, and they decided to keep it a secret. They have decided to keep it a, quote-unquote, Soyuz secret. Now we know that Soyuz is the, uh, up to now, the only way that the astronauts are getting to the ISS. Russia is bringing them up there with these crafts, the Soyuz crafts. And for me, it's totally unacceptable, and I'm sure it's a breach of their contract. Because obviously whatever they do, they have to be, uh, they have to take the safety of the astronauts into account. And also, be open and forthright and truthful to their partner, that is in this case NASA in the United States. Something is going on and they're covering it up and they're breaching their contract. So you cannot have this going on in space. You cannot be carrying your backward dictatorship philosophy and covering up things that you shouldn't be covering up when you're in space. You should have a higher morale, a higher philosophy of truthfulness of cleanliness and morals and ethics. You cannot sell yourself because you're trying to uphold the face, to keep face of your country and your technology. So to me, once we get through those problems, things will be better. But until we stop having this animosity and childish behavior, especially when you're off Earth and in space, where things are very dangerous. It's just not worth going up there. Now, of course, NASA is insisting that Roscosmos inform them how that hole was made. And uh, Roscosmos Russia, on her part, is adamant 
that they will keep it a secret and they will not inform anyone, that is NASA and the world, what happened, how did that happen? What do you think about that? You can't be like that and going out in space. How can anybody trust you? If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.